In this weekly reading, we uh, learn about the mitzvah of Yibum and Chalitza, that when a certain man dies without children, his wife either marries uh, one of the brothers or does Chalitza, meaning takes off a shoe from the brother's foot in front of the judges and says certain things, go, goes through the entire procedure. Uh, chalitza literally means taking off uh, the shoe, the chalots, that is to take off. So this procedure is what we usually do today. Ashkenazim generally do not do yibum. And today even Sephardim are very rarely uh, do the mitzvah of yibum. Generally chalitza is done uh, when the brother dies without children. Although there is a dispute in the Talmud which mitzvah is greater. Ashkenazic sages asking that it's better to do chalitza than yibum and the Sephardim asking that it's better to do yibum, ideally. But at any rate, what I wanted to discuss is an interesting question. It's, I guess, a riddle. Uh, everybody knows this pasuk, this verse in the Sefer Mishlei, Darkea Darkei Noam, we call it Tivotea Shalom, that the uh, ways of Torah are kind, soft, nice ways. I don't know how to translate the word Noam better. The ways of Torah are no nice ways. All her paths are paths of peace. So this verse of uh, Mishle of the Proverbs, the book of Proverbs, is quoted in the Talmud with regards to the mitzvah of Yibum and Chalitza. In what context? For those who don't know, I'm sure a lot of people right away remembered where it's quoted or they could look it up quickly. Uh, the answer is that one might wonder what if, for instance, at the time when a person died, he had a son or a daughter, he had a child. So his wife did not need to go through the mitzvah of Yibu Mohalitsa. But later the child died. Do we need to perform the mitzvah now? And the answer is no. But how do we know that? It doesn't explicitly state if the idea is that the person who died didn't leave an inheritor, uh, so his property will uh, not be inherited by his own descendants. If the idea of Yibum is to leave this person some kind of remembrance, and uh, according to Mikubalim, uh, this person comes in a Gilgul, uh, is reincarnated in the child born from his former wife, from his widow and, and the brother. So then it would similarly, uh, logically, it would similarly apply even if the child existed at the time of the death. If a person died and soon afterwards his child died, logically we would, we would expect that the mitzvah of Yibum would apply. He still left without inheritor. But the Talmud tells us, Darkea Darkei Noam, the ways of Torah are Darkei Noam, nice, kind ways. You cannot imagine that the Torah would make a woman first permitted and then forbidden. Can you imagine that? That the person died. He had a son or a daughter when he died uh, at that time. And his wife, therefore, was able to marry whoever she wanted. And now that she married someone, all of a sudden, this child died. And now this wife would need to go through Halitza. Or, uh, right? It makes no sense that, that, that the woman will be trapped like that. Any widow... Uh, of a man who had children would then always be trapped in a situation that if she marries, she might become forbidden to her husband because retroactively, if the child would die, she would be, uh, she would have to go through Halitza or through Yibum. This makes absolutely no sense. It would be not a kind way. So the Torah, uh, Torah's ways are kind ways, and therefore it makes no sense that it would be so difficult for a woman and for anybody who wants to marry her. So it's interesting that this idea, Darkea Darkei Noam, is used in various books of Halakha on various subjects. I'll give you one example that's uh, Standard Code of Law, and Hafez Chaim is fully dealing with the laws of uh, forbidden speech, Lashon Hara, and other similar uh, gossiping and other similar prohibited speech. So in that uh, work, he discusses, among other things, that in certain cases, one is allowed to speak badly of somebody in order to warn a person. Uh, for example, if someone wants to do a shidduch, they need to be able to find out more about a prospective bride or a prospective uh, groom, chatan, 
right? If they won't be able to find out anything because of the prohibition of forbidden speech of, of speaking badly of others, then they'll never know. No, nobody is, is forced. It would make no sense if the Torah would force people to marry or to go into partnership, into a business partnership, without being able to check the other person out. And uh, this is also Darkia Darkinov, so the author of the Mishnah Brura quotes the, this sugya in the uh, Talmud and tracted uh, uh, Yivamot that discusses uh, the laws of Yibum, but it applies to other things too. Whenever it makes a lot of sense that the Torah would not do such a thing. I actually think that this is the reason that certain rabbis were trying to find out ways to uh, purify Mamzerim. We find, for instance, Marsham and others that, that are trying to retroactively remove the Kiddushin. There were cases that, for instance, a woman got remarried thinking that her husband was dead. And she had good, good reasons to believe that her husband was dead. Especially in the old times when communication was difficult and there was some information uh, that her husband died. And then it turned out that her husband is alive. And he comes back and his wife is married to someone else. And now she has children. And these children are Mamzerim. And this is also in our parsha, in our weekly reading, that the mamzer cannot enter the Khal Hashem, the congregation of Hashem, meaning that he cannot marry a regular Jewish woman. He can marry another mamzeret, he could marry a giyoret, but he cannot marry a regular Jewish woman. But when it's absolutely nobody's fault, uh, it would make sense that the rabbis had a way to purify the mamzerim. And indeed, there were certain ways. Uh, one of the suggestions was that the, the previous husband sends her a get and then does bitul of that get. Uh, so this is one of the possible ways to uh, retroactively make his uh, original marriage, his original kiddushin, invalid. Now, whether this was actually used, it's a big question. After World War II, there were a lot of such cases that uh, the rabbis were trying to find ways to, to do something about. Uh, whether we actually, a lot of times the rabbis today especially are afraid to do anything very unusual. but. Uh, it makes a lot of sense that Hashem would want us to do something like this. Because Darki Darki Noam, and uh, certain laws, they are meant to, to stop people from doing big sins. I mean, the laws of Mamzer have to do with the fact that uh, the parents would not want to commit adultery, for instance, and uh, therefore try to, uh, uh, knowing that, that their child would be a Mamzer, they would hopefully avoid this kind of prohibition. But... Uh, um, even it's nobody's fault, and technically a person is a mamzer still, but in, uh, at least uh, in, it's not the, 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 the spirit of the law is certainly not for this type of scenario. So if there is a way to avoid the um, stigma of mamzerut through the letter of the law, the rabbis would try to do that. There are, in fact, a lot of chuvot, by the way, by uh, contemporary rabbis, like uh, Rav Vadi Yosef, for instance, and others, uh, that try to, whenever possible, find ways to uh, purify, if you could call it this way, uh, to, uh, to remove the stigma of mamzerot from a person. If there's some way, some safek, some way to, to deal with the situation, whenever some, some, some halachic way that, that, that could be found, because halacha doesn't work like the physical world. In the physical world, for instance, let's say take kosher or non-kosher food. Uh, so if in the physical world, if it was, let's say, poison or not poison, you wouldn't rely on any safek. Right? If there was uh, three pieces of meat, for instance, and one of them was poisoned, nobody would want to eat any of these pieces. And not rely on the raw for the majority or anything like that. But in halakha, for instance, um, uh, there are opinions that a person could eat three pieces of meat, but not on the same day. And some say it should be three, uh, three different people. But if one of the three pieces was not, was not kosher, in certain cases, I'm not going to go into specific details, but at least in certain cases, all three people could eat each one a piece of meat, even though one of the three is definitely eating non-kosher, it doesn't matter since the Torah goes by majority. So each one is eating likely the kosher piece, so it's not forbidden to anybody because it doesn't work like physical molecules of kosher and non-kosher. Once uh, they're mixed, and if they were mixed accidentally, the non-kosher meat got uh, mixed in with uh, the kosher pieces, so uh, all three became, according to majority rule, kosher, because it's a, it's a, it's a gezerot that Hashem said, don't eat non-kosher, but uh, also said, follow the majority, so it's not like poison. So the same way with the Gatsum Mamzerut, in particular, the Talmud tells us that Safik Mamzer is only forbidden Drabonan, so we already go one level uh, lighter whenever it's any kind of Safek. But if it would be physical, 
it won't work like that. How does effect help you if it's, let's say, 50% probability that you're doing something wrong? But in the spiritual world, it's different. If uh, for, for various halakhic considerations, something is uh, not forbidden, it doesn't matter that, uh, that uh, just from probability point of view, it should be forbidden or one should be uh, careful. Uh, so in particular, the, the, with Mamzerim, there are certain ways and certain approaches to uh, make uh, a, uh, uh, a person who, who seems to be a Mamzer not being considered Mamzer, and then it doesn't matter what physically happened, actually. Even if there was some way to check physically, let's say with DNA or other ways, whose child it is. Let's say there is some safek, if the child is from uh, a w woman's husband or not. But we don't go by the physical world in these things. We go by uh, the halachic consideration. So if halachically this person can be considered an mamzer, the rabbis will do everything in their power to, to, to permit that person. Uh, there were certain ways that existed in the old times, and apparently even in time of Rishonim, not just in the times of the Talmud, to annul the Kiddushin retroactively. Uh, I already mentioned one way that uh, is suggested, uh, in particular with sending the get and, and uh, annulling it. But there are ways even without any specific trick that in certain cases the Beidin, uh, the rabbis had the power to annul the marriage retroactively if there was a need for it for various spe specific scenarios so i think all of that has to do with the same idea as what i started this lesson with and that is darkia darkinom that hashem wants us to uh, to make torah as uh, norm as a uh, kind as possible to, to the extent that the rabbis can. Of course, the rabbis uh, cannot do everything. It's not, uh, they, they are bound by the, by, the, by the Talmudic law, of course, but still there are enough flexibilities, enough uh, uh, wiggle room, if you could call it. And whenever possible, when the situation arises that it's a question of darkia darkinom, we should try to find ways to make it pleasant. Torah's ways are pleasant ways, and uh, all her paths are paths of peace. And may Hashem grant us peace and grant the people of Israel peace. And uh, there should be peace everywhere.